Um, so I, my name is Kendra Field. I'm from the Center for the Study of Race and Democracy. Um, I wanted to say, I'm also a historian, and I'm, and I'm a historian here in, in the Department of History and Africana Studies at Tufts. And uh, as, as a family historian, someone who traces family and kinship networks in relationship to the North American past, I was really moved by the um, words that our students shared. Um, and I just wanted to say a thank you to Grace Toulousen and, and to all of the phenomenal student voices um, that we got to hear from. Um, we all come from places and from people and peoples, and I believe strongly um, that those pe peoples and places matter, and matter very deeply, and the more we can bring them into our midst and carry them with us as we move forward and move to many different places through our lives, um, the better. So in the spirit of, kind of King's Life work, this program is kind of straddling both the individual and the collective struggles in which we are engaged. We want to think about the relationship between individual and collective struggle um, through the lens of some of the stories that we just heard um, and in the next segment of our program, the relationship between the personal and the political, and these are always kind of inseparable. I'm going to introduce our speakers for the next uh, portion of the event, and then we're going to have kind of open conversation and I hope lots of Q&A at the end. Uh, before I do that, I wanted to mention one other event that's happening on Thursday this week. We will have Brandon Terry, who's a professor of African and African American studies at Harvard, and he'll be speaking, he's a, he's a King scholar, and he'll be speaking on a topic, Reading Martin Luther King Now, The Ethics and Aesthetics of Civil Disobedience. And that will be at 48 Professors Row. And I um, strongly encourage you to attend. If you wish to attend, please do. Um, uh, there should be a sign up at the front desk. And please sign so we just know, because it's a rather small space. OK, so can I ask our, well, I'll read your bios, but you can make your way up to the front. So as I mentioned, our two speakers for today in this conversation are two phenomenal alums who were here several years ago when we did that symposium that I mentioned at the beginning. I'm going to read their bios, and then I will start us off with a few questions and then open it up for Q&A. So Professor Christina Greer, to my left, is an associate professor of political science at Fordham University Lincoln Center. Her research and teaching focus on American politics, black ethnic politics, urban politics, quantitative methods, Congress, New York City, New York State politics, campaigns and elections, and public opinion. Professor Greer's book, Black Ethnics, Race, Immigration, and the Pursuit of the American Dream, investigates the increasingly ethnically diverse black populations in the US from Africa and the Caribbean. She finds that both ethnicity and a shared racial identity matter and also affect the policy choices and preferences for these groups. Professor Greer is currently writing her second book and conducting research on the history of African Americans who have run for the executive office in the United States. Her research interests also include mayors and public policy in urban centers, and her previous work has compared criminal activity and political responses in Boston and Baltimore. She is the host and producer of The Aftermath with Christina Greer on Ozzy.com and a host of a podcast called FAQ NYC. Professor Greer received her BA from Tufts University and her MA, MPhil, and PhD in political science from Columbia University. Zulina Maxwell is the director of progressive programming at Sirius XM and a political analyst for MSNBC. She was formerly the director of progressive media for Hillary Clinton's presidential campaign. She worked in the campaign's press shop, pitching coverage to progressive media outlets and curating daily messaging for online influencers. She also acted as a campaign spokesperson for the presidential debates. She is currently a TV political analyst, speaker, and writer for a variety of national outlets. Her writing is focused on national politics, candidates, and specific policy and culture issues, including race, feminism, domestic violence, sexual assault, victim blaming, and gender inequality. Selena Maxwell's writing has appeared in the New York Daily News, the Washington Post, Jet Magazine, Marie Claire Magazine, thegrio.com, BET.com, Feministing, CNN, and in other mainstream media outlets. She's also a weekly guest and, and fill-in host for Make It Plain with Mark Thompson on Sirius XM Progress and Democratic commentator uh, on MSNBC. Selena Maxwell speaks about feminism, rape culture, race diversity, um, breaking through in social media, blogging and politics. In 2015, very apropos to our, our current um, celebration, Zulina was one of five journalists invited to travel on Air Force One with President Obama on his trip to Selma for the 50th anniversary of Bloody Sunday. I guess the first question that I might pose would be to share with us a little bit 
your experience here at Tufts as a student before you went on to do all of these incredible things, and um, perhaps um, some of the you know challenges you faced here, and also the ways forward that you found um, um, at Tufts um, at your respective times. Um, and you can tell us when you were here and, and what things were like then, um, and then where you went from there. It was just as cold when I went here <laughs> as it is outside right now. And I, w I would say that it was my story of resilience and challenge. Just going, like if you had a friend who lived downhill and you lived uphill, you know, or you had class uphill and you lived down, you know, you know what I'm talking about. Um, so that, that, that really made me tough, going here and having to walk up and down these hills MLK here. would be so proud. <laughs> <laughs> that was shade. That was shade. <laughs> okay. In all seriousness, though, I'm so happy to be back at Tufts. Um, I was thinking about, um, as we were preparing t for this talk, I was thinking um, about overcoming challenges and resilience. And I, I would, you know, I think a lot of my life challenges began after I was here at Tufts. I, I think that if I look back at my time, my four years here, um, you know, not there were challenges, but it, you know, I look back with you know, good feelings. I had, I had a good time here. I learned a lot about myself. I learned a lot about the world. I met so many different people from all over the world who spoke all different languages and whatnot. So I think my feelings about Tufts are positive. Um, but one of the things that I did have to overcome was feeling like I didn't belong um, here at Tufts. And that's not something that was new with going here. That was something that um, I really always felt uh, throughout my life because um, I don't know when it's going to be, but I'm generally the only black person in a room at any given time, and that is still true today in my current job. My current jobs, because I have more than one job. <laughs> um, but in my current jobs, I'm an executive um, at Sirius XM and still um, frequently find myself either the youngest person in the room um, or the only person of color in the room. And so I think my time here at Tufts was the culmination of dealing with that in high school, learning coping mechanisms to try to feel like I fit in in these spaces or at least attempt to try to fit in in these spaces, but also um, you know, speak for, for those folks like me who are not in those rooms. Um, and I think that you know, one of the biggest things that I learned about going here is that if you are the only one, and it just so happens that that's just my lived experience, I'm sure there are people in the room that can relate to that experience, um, is that if there isn't anybody else in the room that looks like you, um, it's unfortunate, but you do often have to speak on behalf of the folks that are like you who are not in the room, even if they don't share your identical experience. And so I think that I learned a lot about doing that here and stepping out sort of in and being really courageous because if you're the only one, everybody's looking at you, it's, it can be really intimidating. But there were so many moments here where I was able to practice that at Tufts, you know, in, in all kinds of different classes. Um, you know, even Spanish classes where I would be the only one trying to um, at least bring a unique perspective that was missing or my perspective that may have been missing in a particular conversation. So I think one of the things that I learned was that even if you've you're in the room and you're the only one and you feel like you do not belong in this room. Somehow somebody has made a mistake, they have put your name on the list by accident and they've overlooked it and somebody's gonna come in and be like, you, you don't belong. Um, that's generally not going to happen. But, it, but it's also um, a reminder of the fact that when you are in that position, take advantage of it. Um, and I think that that's one of the things that I didn't just overcome here, but I practice. I learn how to be that person in the room that raises your hand and um, raises an objection or has an additional point or maybe I wanted to flag something. I mean, that came up a lot in the campaign. You're always the person that's like, I just want to flag for the, for the group that <laughs> it's going to be. You can't tweet that. You're not going to. Don't, don't do that, right? Um, and so I think that Tufts gave me a training ground because, because there are so many different kinds of people here at the school, but at the same time, it's not as diverse as it could be. So you are sometimes the only person. And so take advantage of those moments to practice because you're going to have to do that for the rest of your life, unfortunately, depending upon what field you go into. But you're going to need to use that skill set. Um, thank you all for having me. Uh, I went to Tufts so long ago, there's a J in front of my, <laughs> my number. 
<laughs> I don't even think they do that anymore. Um, that stands for Jackson. Well, hi, Jim. <laughs> um, so I'm Christina Greer. Uh, my story, I mean, I think I, I had to overcome some things before I came to Tufts. I was in a pretty bad car accident my junior year, and I was out of school for three months. Some memory loss, and it was, it was a bit of a trying time. So when I came here, I mean, I honestly have really fond memories of Tufts. It wasn't until our panel, when Zerlina and I were here November of 2015, that I was reminded of some of the adversity and some of the hardships and um, the protests that we went to. Because when I look back on my time here, it's incredibly positive as far as diverse friends, diverse experiences, great mentorship. Um, obviously, the students who spoke earlier uh, this evening are coming with just brilliant stories, but I think the, the running thread is that all of them are using the resources at Tufts, whether it's people or organizations, to find community and build community, which I think is one of the most important things. I will say, when I first started, um, I was a Senate culture rep. Is anyone here on Tufts Senate? Okay, I guess they're taking Monday off or Tuesday off. Um, but I was, uh, I was the representative for the Pan-African Alliance. Um, I won't tell you why I joined, because there was someone on Senate that I wanted to get to know. Um, but all of a sudden, I was <laughs> now I'm a political scientist, and it all worked out. But um, <laughs> I did join the Senate, <laughs> not necessarily because I was interested in the rules of Tufts organization. Um, but I realized I was the Pan-African Alliance culture rep, and uh, the student body had just voted to take away the voting power of all culture reps. Um, so I would go to the meetings, but I had no voting power. Um, and so I immediately became very interested in the meetings because there were a lot of conversations that we were having, um, not just about finances, but about the future direction of uh, the student body. And those of us who represented cultural institutions, we could contribute, but at the end of the day, we couldn't vote. And I think that was my first experience, realizing that the student body had voted to make sure that that wasn't the case. Um, and I was a little thrown off by that. Uh, I will say, I think my largest takeaway that I always try and tell my students um, now that I'm a professor is that you know your mentors um, don't always have to look like you. You know I am the first person of color ever hired at my institution in political science, um, so I am that woman in the room like, hey, I'm here to represent all people of color. Clearly, because in the last 175 years, you all have not <laughs> seen it fit to ever hire someone. Um, but I do think that it's really important to make sure that you know it would have been lovely if half of the department <laughs> looked like Pearl Robinson and Mary Marilyn Glader at the time, but I had Jim Glazer, Jeff Berry, um, and lots of other professors that really cultivated my intellectual curiosities and really pushed me to think about things, um, not as black women, but one of the most important um, experiences I think I had as a sort of young burgeoning scholar when I was thinking about becoming a professor, and I wasn't really sure about the lifestyle and what I wanted, um, Jim Glazer set up a meeting with me to, to meet with uh, Melissa Noble, who's a young, at the time she was a, a young professor at MIT, just to talk to her about the discipline and what the life of a young black female professor would look like. And so I think it's really important for you to just use the resources at the university because there's so many. I mean, I think that's the thing that I sort of kick myself about. Yeah. There's so many talks that I didn't go to for whatever reason. <laughs> there's so many um, people that, Tufts is brought to campus that I just, you know, I was just being 19 and I wasn't motivating necessarily in the ways that I could or should. Um, and just the different centers and resources that are always putting things on, I think that is sort of my one sort of old woman on the porch waving a wooden spoon saying like, here's what you need to do. Right. Um, I would say to really um, step outside of yourself. And I, th I think, you know, I, I utilized a lot of the different resources that Tufts had, but I still think that there's so many um, that I just didn't take advantage of. And I would love, you know, if I had the time and the opportunity now, I would love to do that. So I'll pause there. Great. Um, well, I wonder if I could ask you to speak a little more about some of the um, um, experiences you had at Tufts that shaped your own kind of research agenda mm -hmm. and or your kind of you know, relationship to organizing? 
Um, so I'll start with the preface of my book, Black Ethnics, colon, Race, Immigration, Pursuit of the American Dream. Political scientists always have to have a colon and then like a long thing after the <laughs> title. So the title is just Black Ethnics, but Race, Immigration, Pursuit of the American Dream. And I, I wrote the book, as, as Kendra explained, um, looking at political attitudes of black Americans, African immigrants, and Afro-Caribbeans who live in the United States, primarily in New York. But I start the book off uh, with a preface about my experience at Tufts, going uh, to Cape in, or going to Cape Cod. Do you all still go to Cape Cod? Black students still go to Cape Cod? Who here in the room went to Cape Cod? Okay, so I, I loved it. I mean, when I went to private schools, you know, I was always the lone chocolate chip in the cookie, right? And when I got to Tufts in 1996, which was an election year, um, I was part of the largest black class that Tufts had ever had. It was 60 of us out of 1,200, which to me it was basically like going to Howard, right? <laughs> I mean, it was like I'd never been around so, <laughs> like, the bar was pretty low. But I'd never been around so many black students in one place. I just hadn't. And so going to the Cape was phenomenal. It was a really great experience um, to go before classes start and just meet my student, you know, my fellow colleagues, um, two of whom I just got back from Mexico with last week. Um, and we met on Cape Cod. But one of the, the activities that sort of shaped much of my Tufts experience, but also my um, academic pursuits, was the facilitator at the time asked everyone in the room to close their eyes and to raise their hands if their parents told them, when you get to Tufts, don't get wrapped up with the black kids. Which I thought was a very odd question as a black American coming to Tufts and being very excited to be around 60 black students. And so I obviously opened up my eyes and I saw that everyone's hands were raised except for the six black Americans on the trip, which spawned a series of conversations about Caribbeans and Africans and their parents and expectations and assumptions about black Americans being last place, white power structures, etc. So I ended up essentially writing a book trying to really tussle through those those feelings because over the next four years, we saw, and at the time we were called the Pan-African Alliance. What is the BSA, BSU called now? Okay, so there we go. So at the time, our Black Student Union had been renamed the Pan-African Alliance to be a little more inclusive. But when I was here, the Caribbean students broke off and formed their own Caribbean society, and then the African students broke off and formed the African society. But I was fascinated that they both both groups maintained a relationship with the Pan-African Alliance, which is essentially the BSA. So they had this dual relationship that was both racialized and based on their ethnicity. Um, and so in many ways, that is the genesis of my intellectual project. Um, because for me, coming to Tufts, I had always been in a space where you're either black or not black, right? Um, for a host of reasons that we can get into in Q&A. Uh, but this was a, a much more nuanced understanding of not just race, but also the mixture of race and class, mm -hmm. race, class, and geography, um, race, class, ethnicity, and geography, where we had some really hard conversations at various times. I mean, there are so many times where we were at Cape and House, and at the time, um, I don't know how it is now, but um, no one drank at Cape and House. No one did drugs, no one smoked. It was just music. Yet all of our parties would always get closed down. And I was like, we can literally go three doors down. and You can get all the drugs you want from various frat houses, but no one's closing those parties down. So there was always this tension, this racialized tension of this assumption that the black kids were up to something. It's like, no, it's just music um, and nothing else. And so those were some of the conversations that we had that I, I can now have with you know, my students, but obviously it served me well moving forward. Yeah. Uh, well, since you mentioned that it was an election year when you arrived at Tufts, it was. <laughs> um, I might shift gears towards our current um, political moment um, and also think back to when you were here just three and a half years ago for that particular symposium right here at this table. Um, we were in a really different moment, and I can remember, you know, I have really vivid memories of that day, of the conversations, um, of Robin Kelly's talk, and of mm -hmm. all of your. Um, really um, incredible reflections on the moment we were in then, which was, you know, 
just really different moments. So I wonder yeah. if you could speak a little bit about what's changed in the past three and a half years. Um, I mean, you don't have to cover it all. Um, but perhaps as if you can imagine being a college student, perhaps someone about to graduate to think about, you know, what are my next steps or my first steps right beyond this, this campus, um, what that might feel like. Well, my, my first pitch is really just, if you are interested at all in politics, there are going to be like at least 20 Democratic campaigns that you will be able to get plenty of experience on. And certainly if you're going second tier, third tier down, you're, you'll get even better experience and more hands-on experience because, um, you know, the top talent is going to go to the first tier pretty quickly. It's already happening. Um, so that's my pitch to work on campaigns because I think it's it's invaluable experience. It's... You know, and I'm not just talking door knocking and making phone calls. I'm talking about digital strategy, messaging strategy, communication strategy, and you will be able to, um, you know, do those things, particularly on, you know, one of these Democratic campaigns. Because what I learned from working on now two presidential campaigns is there comes a point where whatever structure they have laid out, this is like who does what, and this is the hierarchy, um, it pretty much gets thrown in the trash at a certain point, um, and you just fill in the gaps. You see somebody is not talking to that person. Okay, I'm going to take that job. Somebody needs to call um, you know, this progressive media outlet. All right, I got that. That's my job. I know that person. That girl went to high school with me, so I, I have her email. I can communicate with her. So um, my pitch for campaigns is that there are a lot of opportunities to fill in the gaps and get experience in things you probably never even thought you would be able to get experience in. Um, additionally, the networking opportunities are next to none because you're working with the top tech people in America because that's basically the tech talent is all going to be siphoned and work on these presidential campaigns. Um, so then that can then set you up for you know, a real job, permanent job later. So that's just my pitch for campaigns. But... Thinking about the fact that we were here in November 2015 is crazy to me because, um, you know, that was really pre the possibility of a President Trump. Um, but it also was a moment where I didn't plan on working on the Hillary Clinton campaign. Um, that wasn't my ambition. I worked for Obama. I was a journalist. I was, you know, an advocate um, and speaking on campuses about campus sexual assault and domestic violence. That was my space. That's where I was at. And um, Iowa happened. I'm still a political analyst. I'm still writing articles. I'm still being a journalist. New Hampshire happens. I think she lost by like, you know, point. That was a decimal point. Um, and then I got a call the next day um, from the campaign asking me to come join. Um, and I didn't think about it. It wasn't like one of those things where like, you know, I'll, I'm going to have to think about it. I'll get back to you. I immediately said yes because I had previously... I think two days earlier, before the New Hampshire primary, the night before they had a debate, and it was Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton, and it was all about foreign policy. And they asked Hillary about North Korea, and she goes through her spiel, and they asked Bernie Sanders about North Korea, and <laughs> this is not shade, but he, it just didn't, I was terrified by the end of it, because it, was, it clearly was not his, you know, best topic. So I was terrified. Donald Trump was in first place on the Republican side, so I'm like, oh my God, Donald Trump's going to be the president. We're going to die. Um, <laughs> that's literally like what I was thinking. So, so when I get when I get when I get that call the next day, it's you know there isn't a hesitation, um, you know, for me to think it through. I was literally saying, okay, I have to join because it's either I join and help or it's the end of the world. That was really how it felt that day, right? Um, and so it's it seems so far from. December or November 2015, um, when we were having a really robust conversation um, about, you know, even critiques of Hillary Clinton that I agree with. I didn't join the campaign because I think she's like, you know, the perfect angel that's never done anything incorrect. It's that I watched a debate where a candidate that could win a primary against Donald Trump just had no idea what they were talking about in terms of really the biggest national security issue in that moment. And it was terrifying. Um, and so I think now, sitting here today, <laughs> mm. <laughs> I don't feel differently. Um, I don't feel differently about the existential threat that we face. But what I do think is that it, it, it gives me, you a moment to sit down and figure out where you're going to put your energy and to fix what problems. Because in this moment, it can feel like it's overwhelming. 
um, because of just like tweets and news and controversies and Mueller and just so much going on. There seems to be, you know, a myriad problems all throughout the globe that, and you can't fix it. It's too big, right? Because we used to live in a world where, you know, I didn't have to check my phone. I could kind of like go about my day and not really worry if the president was going to do something that was going to endanger my life <laughs> on Twitter that day. Um, you could sort of check out and just go about your daily stresses and your daily routine without having too much of a concern for what was going on in the White House. Um, and I think that that has changed. So one of the things that I reflect upon frequently is, am I spending the majority of my time putting, putting my effort and energy towards fixing problems that I can actually fix? And if I'm just doing that, somebody over here is going to go over here and point their energies in a different direction and fix those problems. Because I can't fix them all because it's, it's too overwhelming. That's what this moment feels like. It feels like you're, you're being bombarded by problems nonstop. And it can feel chaotic and like nothing will get better. It feels overwhelming. I feel numb a little bit in this moment. Um, but one of the things that I reflect upon, especially since we were talking about what it was like in our conversation when we were here three years ago, it feels like it's still a moment in which I have to um, work hard, you know, like try to, to do the things that I'm passionate about to try to fix the problems that I, I am, am really, that resonate with me that I find to be the, the biggest problems that, um, that I can actually do something to fix. Um, and, and I can't really worry about the rest. I can't, I can't, can't let that overwhelm me um, because it can get overwhelming. And I don't, that's not the most eloquent way to say that, but essentially what I'm saying is I know this moment is crazy, um, but even just recently thinking about three years ago, it was still crazy then. There were still just as many problems. It's now that they're just a little bit more in your face now. Um, but no, don't get numb and just give up. Find some way to channel your passion into fixing a problem. And I guess that's all I wanted to say about that. It was just like channel it somewhere and like don't get distracted by the mess because the mess is still going to be there, right. you know, even after your one problem is fixed. Right. I mean, I always tell my students two things. One, you should work on a campaign. Two, you should get robbed. Not by gunpoint, but like you should like come home and not have your stuff. And so... But working on a campaign of some sort is really important just because you need to see structures, you need to see how communications work, you need to see your candidate give the same talk to very different communities. And they and need stress. young people. Yeah, they do. They want to reach people. out to millennials. And there were tons of millennials in the campaign, but there need to be more. <laughs> They need to listen to millennials yeah. next mm -hmm. time. Um, so um, I think the, the thing about Tufts is, you know, it talks about being a citizen of the world, and I think it's true, right? And we have to see ourselves um, in whatever occupation we choose. And so here's the thing. Everyone is good for something. And so obviously I'm going to put in a plug for political science and join the political science department, either taking classes domestically or international relations, because it's going to help you make some sort of sense of it. I do joke around that my American political science degree is basically like a computer science degree from the 1950s, because I'm like, what are we doing, right? I mean, our institutions are being stretched to the limit. Our constitution is weeping right now. But I think, um, obviously, we need to maintain our level of curiosity. And we have to read. I think that there's this, you know, reactionary sense that we're all in, but there's still something about reading um, that is imperative. And I'm not too sure if I can state that enough. Um, but I would say, you know, even if you're not going to go into politics, it's exhausting. I mean, I can't believe I've decided to dedicate my life to American politics and I, I actually have to read the news every single day. I'm, obviously, you see, I'm look, looking at my phone and I'm trying not to touch it just because I'm on a panel. But I do think, I always tell people, everyone's good for something. Even if you go to J.P. Morgan or, you know, you decide to be an eye banker, it's like, yeah, I mean, or a corporate lawyer, right? Someone needs to finance the revolution, right? Someone needs to pay for young candidates who want to run against an incumbent and actually need something. And so, I mean, I would hope that also, for those of you who might be a little discouraged by the current political moment, there are a lot of really interesting young people who are running, not just on the presidential level, but down ticket matters. And so I've been thinking about this idea of political tithing. So some of our speakers earlier talked about their faith and how important their faith was to them. 
And obviously, when you belong to a faith-based institution, you also tithe to that institution because you want to see it thrive and flourish. That's the same way I feel about my political institutions. So if I see a young person or an interesting person running for um, some sort of elected office, it doesn't matter if it's not in New York City. Um, I support them financially, and I try and get other people to support them financially because that's my way of buying into seeing the, the type of democracy that I want. So I put in a little plug for that as well. Great. Um, so I want to maybe bring us in this maybe last question before we open up to Q&A. I want to bring us, maybe second to last, sorry, uh, back to King and to, you know, modern civil rights movement. Um, if we can think, as I know both of you can, to, um, to his lifetime and to, um, you know, five decades ago and then where things stand today. I mean, do you have reflections upon... Um, how, you know, what the relevance of King might be to our current moment. I prefer to remember King sort of um, less, I have a dream speech, more Birmingham, yeah. letter from Birmingham jail, sort of Vietnam speech at Riverside Church, the sort of less sanitized mm -hmm. King that sort of Republicans <laughs> like to quote. Um, there's a there's a scholar at the University of Colorado, a legal scholar who said that um, right wing just right-wing judges cite King 87 times more than left-wing judges before they hand down um, basically life sentences to black people. Um, and so the way he's been utilized by particular um, institutions rubs me the wrong way. So I prefer to remember the King that actually fought for jobs and freedom, um, that was trying to organize all people, right? And so, I mean, King wasn't assassinated. I mean, everyone keeps saying he died. It's like he didn't die of right, cancer. He right. was assassinated, right? right? Um, and so King's assassinated because he's trying to mobilize poor people across not just the United States, but the world, right? I mean, he dies, he dies. He's assassinated organizing sanitation workers in Memphis, right? He's, his latter writings talk about poor white people in Appalachia and how they share more in common with the Negro than they'd like to think, right? Going back to what LBJ says, if you convince the poorest white man that he's better than the Negro, you can rob his pockets all day long. We're seeing that now. And so I think the king that I like to remember is one that understood this collective identity of injustice and how we can band together to, to fight it. I've been thinking a lot about um, the moment we're in in terms of the normalization of racism in this moment. Um, I remember um, on the campaign, we it was me and one other person. I think it was the Latino media person. I think it was that that was who we we kind of like made eye, con eye contact in meeting. You know, again, very few people of color in these high-level meetings talk, coming up with messaging, coming up with the words that Hillary Clinton is going to say. Um, and it felt like we needed to have a pull aside. You know, it was one of those kind of cities. I don't know if it was around the hiring of Steve Bannon or when she was going to make a speech about white nationalism and the alt-right. Um, but we were like, we need to have like our own meeting, like a meeting, we call it the meeting before the meeting. Um, you sort of have the powwow. Um, the people of color did this a lot on the campaign. So if you're ever in a larger organization um, or even here at, in a campus setting, if you have like the meeting before the meeting, all right, this is what we're gonna do in the meeting. You know, where you sit down and you have sort of two or three people discuss, that can be really powerful um, in trying to communicate what you're trying to get across in the larger, um, meeting. So that's just a pro tip um, I've learned in my many years of sort of being in big organizations. But we had a pull aside and essentially what we landed on was Donald Trump is normalizing racism. That was what we came out of our meeting before the meeting. Um, and we, we basically decided that we needed to go into the larger meeting and communicate this to the higher ups in the campaign because we needed to start saying this that he's normalizing racism in a way that is making it socially acceptable again to be overtly racist in public without any consequences. And that was what we, he was doing. It wasn't that he was just saying things that were you know, upsetting or racist. He wasn't just, you know, he didn't just have a few supporters that were saying things that were upsetting and racist. He was actually emboldening a certain portion of the country that you know, is really dangerous to embolden, um, given the fact that we had an understanding of American history in a way that I think, you know, some of the people that were higher up weren't thinking in those terms. Um, and so 
I, I say all that to say that, again, we don't want, want the sanitized king. Um, but I also don't like the, I have a dream, you know, we're not, we're, we're thinking about the content of the character and not the color of the skin as if the color of your skin is irrelevant. The color of your skin doesn't dictate how people treat you from the moment you're born to the moment you pass away. Um, that it doesn't dictate so many things about your existence on this planet. Um, and so I think in this moment, it's a moment where we embrace difference um, and actually talk about it um, and, and instead of trying to assimilate, like I hate that word too. So that's, you know, in this moment, I am celebrating difference and embracing it. And, you know, I love to hear about, you know, just exactly where somebody is from and, and what brought them there and how many ethnicities they are, even if it's just one. But I think it's important to highlight and embrace difference. And so in this moment, I think, when I'm reflecting on Dr. King, but also in a moment where racism is normalized in a way that we haven't seen um, in a long time, but even that's not true, right? Because there, there have always been racist, overt racist things happening consistently throughout time. It's just that there have been moments that it has been more high profile than other times. And so I think that who we have in the White House and the normalization of overt expressions of racism, um, despite the controversy over, you know, I'm sure all of you saw the, the video from um, the weekend in your social media feeds and the, you know, ongoing commentary of like, what, who did what first and who escalated what first, but everybody, I think, watching that, you either view it as the person who is the powerful person or the, a person who has faced some sort of oppression and discrimination and that's how you view the video. If you walk away from the video thinking that kid was smiling, then you probably have lived your life um, as somebody with more power than another person, or you've been in that privileged position. But most people who are, have not been in that position know exactly what that face was. And despite the details of what transpired prior, um, we know that face. That face is the face of hate. We've seen that face in lynching photos and, you know, lunch counter photos. We've seen that throughout the course of history, whether it be color photos or black and white. And it, what, what I reflect on in this moment is that we cannot allow people to sanitize what we see with our own eyes um, because Donald Trump has normalized racism in a way that we can't look away from it. It is in our faces. Um, and so I, I say all of that to say that I think the radical Dr. King is, is one that I... I feel like I want to embody more um, because it's necessary in this moment. It's not sufficient because we, you know, I don't know what would be sufficient to eradicate that, but I think in this moment we all have to sort of be brave in, in the way that Dr. King was uh, later um, in terms of, you know, bucking um, the trend and coming out against the war and talking about poverty um, in, in such explicit terms. So I think it's, it's this moment that you can't sit it out and, and say that we're just gonna all sing kumbaya and hold hands because it's not gonna work. Thank you. Okay, my last question, and then we have about a half hour for Q&A. Um, if, if you could um, perhaps speak to, and we've talked about race and class, intersection of those, uh, speak to kind of um, intersectional politics in this moment, be it on campus or, or beyond, um, the relationship, I mean, or the experience of the two of you as women, um, in politics today, um, or in academia today, um, if you could speak about gender, race, and the intersection of the two. <laughs> um, I have some things to say about being black and being a woman. Um, <laughs> no, I, I, uh, I think I think that it's it's an interesting thing to to be in a space right now in politics where being black and being a woman is something that that people take as something valuable to the insight that you provide. So, you know, going back to my time on the campaign, I would say that at first you're like, okay, well, I'm not as experienced as these other people who've worked like 10 Senate campaigns. I mean, there are some people that just go from campaign to campaign. I think that's insane, but there, there is a type of person that does that. So you're in this room with all these people that you've read about that, you know, that are, Basically, like, they're celebrities to you, right? Because you're like, hi, John Podesta. 
you know, like <laughs> that's a that's a celebrity to you if you are interested in politics. Um, and so I would say that being a black being black and being a woman in that particular space allowed me to inf use my lived experience to inform the people that I was working with, um, whether it be like flags that they're missing or messaging that they're missing or ways to communicate to the community that I came from or even communities I didn't come from. Um, and understanding that my lived experience is actually valuable. That, that the value that I bring to the table isn't necessarily something that I would have read in a book. So I would say that in this political moment, um, use every tool in your toolbox, and that includes your identity, to educate those around you, and educate may not be the perfect word to use in that, that context, but to illuminate what your lived experience was and what you bring to the table, and sort of how that impacts the topic that you're talking about. Because I think that, you know, certainly, I understand how important it is for Beyonce to endorse Hillary Clinton, but maybe John Podesta doesn't, right? I mean, that's just a sort of light example, but understanding what you bring to the table beyond just what's on your resume, what's, uh, you know, what your credentials are, and what you've read in the book. Um, because your lived experiences and your identity in living those experiences is valuable, especially in this moment when, you know, Fortune 500 companies are trying not to mess up on Twitter. You know, you don't want to have a, a Twitter moment where your company is completely humiliated and embarrassed and people have to get fired, right? So you can bring your lived experiences um, to the table in that context, but also in the political context. Um, because there were plenty of moments during the campaign where I stopped them from tweeting something that would have been a bigger problem. Um, so. All of that to say is use every single tool, and that includes what you've experienced growing up and how you've lived in your body, because you're the only one. You're literally the only person that has your lived experiences and your perspective, and that actually matters in this moment, because every single experience, especially cultur culturally unique experiences, they not at, basically on these campaigns in this political moment, it's very homogeneous. And so if you can add any new flavor, that is going to help. Because the electorate that you are trying to win looks like this room, right? It doesn't necessarily look like a boardroom or, or the senior leadership of a campaign, which can be very homogeneous, so. Um, so as a black woman, I mean, I just always remind myself that I'm a global majority. There's so many times where I'm sitting in meetings and everyone's like, you know what, well, as a double minority, Chrissy. I'm like, I'm actually a global majority. I'm a woman, and it's more of us <laughs> in, the, in the world than men, and it's more people of color than white people. So I don't see myself as a minority at all. Um, so it's one, the first thing is about the framing of it. Um, and then secondly, you know, identity politics has gotten such a, a bad rap these days and everyone's like, oh, I'm so tired of identity politics. We've always had identity politics mm -hmm. in the United States. It's just been the, the politics of white men. And now we're actually opening the conversation to say right. other people's lived experiences matter. And now it's like, oh goodness, now we're gonna hear about the ladies and you know the coloreds. And it's like, no, this is actually, we've only prioritized white male feelings and now we're not. And so we can actually have multiple conversations about identity. We can learn how to chew and what, walk and chew gum at the same time. And so I think as a professor, um, recognizing my value in the classroom as someone who, you know, when I inevitably get the question once a semester, like, how did you end up here? And I'm like, mm -hmm. well, I got three degrees on top of the one you're trying to get. So that's one. Uh, two. <laughs> so that's how I ended up here. But recognizing that... <laughs> Just because something is new and different doesn't make it wrong, doesn't make it bad. And so I think going exactly to Zerlina's point, I mean, for me, because the news is so negative these days and because it's so easy to just be in a constant state of rage and ire, um, I'm really trying to practice compassion um, and really remembering that people are all coming from different places and they might not be where I am right now, um, I read some of the papers that I wrote at Tufts, and I was like, did you? I mean, I reread my senior <laughs> honors thesis. And I was like, did you really say that broken windows was like a pretty good idea? Like, 
maybe you did. And so like recognizing that we all evolve. Um, and you know, we read, we have more experiences. And so being patient with others, but also being patient with ourselves, but putting ourselves in positions where we are not just in these homogeneous spaces, where we're allowing ourselves to take advantage of being in intellectually diverse spaces as well, um, to just push ourselves. Uh, because to me, none of this makes sense. <laughs> It, all of it makes sense and none of it makes sense simultaneously. And I'm really grappling with um, being kind to myself as I'm trying to sift through sort of the historical nuances of the present moment that we're in and recognizing that not everyone is going to have my experience as a black woman and sort of meet me where I am when I need them to meet me there. And so I think that's um, what I'm working on. Um, thank you both so much. Um. Wow, um, I love that last question um, because it's something that, that I've been thinking about lately and I think that there's a show that's coming up soon, but my question is always, or my question recently has become, when we think about Martin Luther King, when we think about the civil rights movement, when we think about all of the protesting and all of the injustices to people of color, we talk about and we think about the civil rights movement in that, that sense. But what about all of those people who, who had dogs, who had water that they were splashing on people, who were taunting people those people who came to lynchings and brought their families to see a lynching, we never talk about them in the sense of our civil rights being violated. And it's time for us to really focus on that. What kind of person would really think that that would be okay to do? And so I'm hopeful that this conversation and future conversations that we will have on this campus, that we will start to think about um, the, the situations on this campus that happen and who's missing from the conversation, who's missing from the room. The Africana Center is about to celebrate its 50th year on this campus. I'm really happy and proud about that I'm happy that the university has over all these years supported the Africana Center, but it's not up to us to teach you. It's not up to the students of color to, have, to um, help understand and bring about um, communities of difference in, in our everyday lives on this campus. I can't begin to tell you how many times I get called or I get an email message from um, someone who wants me to recommend or nominate or send them students because they happened to look around and saw that there were no black students in the room. There were no students of color in the room. That's not our job. That's not what Dr. King when he talked about a beloved community. That's not what, what this is all about. And so I'm hopeful, I'm very grateful to Tufts University and this long list of sponsors that we have that make it possible for us to continue to have this kind of event to celebrate Dr. King and to give us the forum that we need to start having serious serious conversations. And so I guess I'm challenging all of us to look around, ask those really tough questions. It's not okay. It's not okay. This world that we're living in right now, we need each other. We need each other more now than we have ever. And I think that that is why we chose the quote of Dr. King that we are using today. We are all interrelated. 
It's all of our problem. It's not a black and white problem anymore, thanks to number 45. It is not just our problem. And so I'm challenging all of you, when you leave this room, think about how we can make this a community where everybody feels that they belong. I'm committed to continuing to try, and I hope that you will as well. Um, and on that note, I'd like to thank our alum. We always love seeing you come back to campus. I told them every time I see them on MSNBC, I'm like, that's Chrissy, that's Sarlita. And my husband's like, yeah, I know, they went to Tufts. <laughs> but I get very excited about that. And I hope that the students that are in the room heard the messages that they were giving you about using the resources that are on this campus. There are a lot of us out here who are here dedicated to helping you make this your community. And um, for all of the um, uh, sponsors, again, we say thank you, that we will continue this work, and we'll see you next year. Thank you so much for coming.